Uh, everyone, my name is Mike Ross, and I'm really honored to be able to be the moderator uh, for today. Uh, I am a former Boston City Councilor, a recent former Boston City Councilor, recent uh, candidate for mayor, and uh, a uh, transportation enthusiast. Uh, and I'm here, like, like many of you, uh, to discuss transportation. Today's topic is called the future of transportation, the future of cars, the future of uh, commuting. And we have up here a very interesting panel uh, of speakers. I want them to just do like a real quick uh, who they are. Uh, and we really want to get your voice in this conversation. I, I've talked informally with a couple of the panelists. And uh, we think the best conversations are those that we can have with each other. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to try to foster that. But this is like that show, one of these things is not like the other. I know that Sarah Hamilton, from our work together, uh, runs Masco. And I know that Peter Spelios is developing buildings, including buildings that may or may not have transportation that he's going to talk about. And they all have different challenges. I mean, they all have transportation, but you know, have different challenges around cars and parking and, and access. But I am really interested to hear how, how Chrissy, Chrissy Gibson, Chrissa Gibson is connected, because Chrissa is a carpenter and a sculpturer. So, uh, Krista, we're going to start with you to introduce, uh, in introduce us to you, why you're here, and uh, what you're bringing uh, to the conversation about transportation. Krista. Do you want me to start my slideshow, or do you want me to just... Yeah, why don't you just start a quick introduction, and then maybe okay. I'm glad to know you have a slideshow. Anyone else bring a slideshow with them? Yeah. I have a dance. Okay, all right. So we have two slideshows and a dance. So I know how we're going to structure well, that. Well, why don't you start, and then I'll just go into my slideshow. And that Krista, who's moderating something. here? I'm Come sorry. on, all right. <laughs> I didn't. Tell us who you are, and, and if you could speak right up to the microphone. Okay. Uh, you can actually. You may even want to take that out and, and hold it. However, you want to do it. Krista. How's that? Krista Gibson. How's that? No. Is it on? Is it on? Okay. I don't like this part. Um, my name is Krista. Krista Gibson. I say Krista because my husband is Chris and it gets a little confusing at home sometimes. Uh, I come from Oak Tree Development, uh, and I'll tell you a lot more about that. OK, all right. Well, um, Sarah, if you just a brief introduction. Hi, my name is Sarah Hamilton. I'm the Vice President of Area Planning and Development at MASCO, which is a nonprofit serving hospitals and colleges in the Longwood area. Um, I do not run MASCO, Mike, but thanks for the promotion. Um, I hope my boss isn't listening right now. <laughs> uh, and I think um, people asked me to be a part of this panel because we, uh, among the other things that we do, we run a TMA, uh, which tries to get people out of their cars. And today I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that. Excellent. And our dancer, Peter, Peter Spellios from Related Beal. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Peter Spellios uh, with Related Beal. Uh, we do um, mostly development. Related Beal does it mostly in urban areas uh, and nationally as well. And um, if, I, if I heard Mike correctly last night on Greater Boston with Emily Rooney, I'm here today because apparently we're doing a project that has um, very little parking, and it's worthy to talk about. We're excited to talk about the Lovejoy Project, which will be the first project in the city with car less, no parking, um, depending how you count it. Uh, but let's start with Sarah from Masco uh, and, and her presentation, uh, and, and then we'll go to, <laughs> then we'll go to Krista. No, no, it's you, Sarah. <laughs> it, it, I, I think, I think it's good. because my slides are up oh, on the screen. my bad. Krista, it's you. <laughs> so. I, I pay no attention to this. <laughs> Man standing at this thing. <laughs> Chris uh, Gibson, uh, you're on. I'm going to sit down and watch. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, when Bill Rialt, uh, there you are, uh, phoned me and asked me to be a part of this, I thought, why would I ever want to spend the day talking about something that's such a pain point for developers? And I have to say, I apologize to you. It's been a great day. I've learned a lot. It's been really interesting. Um, I'm really glad I'm here. And let me start by uh, talking a bit about my organization, Oak Tree Green Line. Uh, we've been about 38 years in the business. We're a really small firm, four or five people. Uh, we have about 2,000 units throughout uh, New England, but primarily in the Cambridge area. We've been building smart growth communities long before there was a word 
smart growth. And we're especially well known for our ability to uh, listen and to work with uh, neighbors and uh, municipalities. Um, here's one of our uh, buildings in uh, Cambridge. We've talked a lot about Cambridge today. I think you should know that Oak Tree works to the triple bottom line, and we'll talk about that as it relates to parking. Uh, in other words, we're always looking at uh, the people, at the planet, at profit. We are a private sector business. And um, I always add a fourth P, which is partnership, because frankly, we couldn't do what we do without partners. We build to smart growth. Is Stephanie here? She left. Um, you see that building? up on the slide there, that is one of the uh, buildings in Newtonville uh, in the parking lot that she was talking about. We're one of the bidders. Uh, Oak Tree uh, has bid on the uh, site. And right now, um, I think we've supposedly tied for first. Our fingers are crossed as to whether or not we'll get it. It's an excellent location. And the really important part about it is that the city of Newton has been very, very thoughtful about what that space can be used for, how it can serve the community, and has put out an RFP that takes all of these things into consideration. I need to mention uh, Greenstacks, which is our patented building system. Um, what we do is we build boxes. We build them in Maine, and we stack them like Legos. And what's kind of important in terms of parking is that it's a grid, and underneath the grid is where the parking goes. So it, it uh, dictates the size of the parking spaces, which are slightly smaller than most standard parking spaces. I think it's also important to mention that um, the green stacks, they're, they're very efficient and allows us to very effectively meet um, uh, economic and, uh, objectives of, of cities and to get things in and out quickly. This is just what the boxes look like when they're flying. That's what they're called, flying boxes. So how do these uh, guiding principles uh, and values apply to Oak Tree's experience with parking? Uh, it's not easy. It's hard. Um, but let's take a look at it. People. When people have cars, they need to park them. Let me tell you about Seven Cameron, which is one of our uh, buildings in Cambridge. It's on Massachusetts Avenue, and it's a uh, walking distance to uh, Davis Square. We thought, okay, people are going to move into the building. Possibly they won't have cars. Hopefully they won't have cars. We'll encourage them not to have cars. We'll charge rent for the parking space. Okay. Uh, a lot of people moved in the building, loved the building. Garage was empty. You know where they were parking? On the street. They thought, why should we pay for parking when we can park on the street? The neighbors got upset for good reason, it was very good reason, came to us and what we did was take the, um, eliminate the rent for the parking, include the parking in your rent, the garage filled up, the streets emptied out, and everybody's happy, except the ozone, the planet. Um, when people don't have cars, uh, they, need a, 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 they need to get around, so we always build near, near transit. Something that's been really interesting for us is we've discovered, and I, I don't know, that probably other people have too, is that pe people are willing to walk 0.6 miles. Not 0.7, not 0 0.8, 0 0.6 miles to get to transit. What is that? I don't know. 10 minutes? 15 minutes? 12 minutes, depending on how fast you walk. People are willing to do that. You build further than that, and they're more likely to choose a car than public transit. Um, planet, when a car is required, uh, there's different things that we do to try to, uh, to help. We put in EV charging stations, we do, uh, high, we do for hybrid. Um, in Newtonville, we would have a system set up where we'd, we would actually give transit passes to people who didn't have cars. We use zip cars. Something interesting, though, about Zipcar is our project in West Concord that we're building right now. Zipcar won't put cars out there because it's too far out. And too many people are using cars, so they feel that their car, they have a limited stock, won't be used. That was kind of interesting. 
Um, in terms of uh, uh, profit, it's expensive. You saw the numbers earlier, 30,000, that's about right, per parking stall. That really increases the cost of um, housing. I just want to mention briefly about, um, about the demographics right now. Uh, what we're finding is that um, recently Oak Tree's been, been responding to a call for an urban-suburban projects from smaller communities in the greater Boston area. And what they're looking for is, is housing people um, who are younger and people who are older. So demographics, uh, the cost of housing in Boston is really prohibitive for a lot of people. Uh, quality, speed, and um, uh, the uh, green of our system is what people are interested in. And also this commonwealth-wide concern about housing our young people as they transit out of um, university and into their jobs. I think this is really interesting. There's 351 communities in Massachusetts uh, with a population of, uh, uh, in the Commonwealth, and 86 of them are cities or towns with populations of more than 20,000. So I think we're gonna see more and more of a call on the part of those, um, of those communities for urban suburban, for a way to keep their people in town, um, for a way to re revitalize economic activity, to, for increased in-time vitality, and for access to public transit. Uh, it's really an opportunity for these kinds of smart growth uh, communities. In support of these objectives, uh, Oak Tree is able to add green stacks for green, access to transit, walkability, and a choice of housing, and back to partnership, the municipality adds uh, community collaboration, smart growth, zoning, and the identification of a sense of place. Let me uh, talk a little bit about 30 Haven, um, which is in Reading, Mass. Um, 30 Haven uh, was in response to the town of Reading in 2009, along uh, with the help of the state, uh, voted to designate a section of the town's center as a 40R smart growth overlay district. There were lots of considerations, lots of reasons, but three of them included transportation, economic development, and housing. In terms of transportation, um, ours is transit-oriented, commuter rail, bus routes. Uh, by the way, this is where that point six really starts to count. We're about 800 feet from the uh, transit station, the commuter rail. It's also pedestrian-oriented, walkable, bicycle-friendly. Economic development, really important. We have five retail bases. And I, gotta, I have to tell you a story. One of my uh, residents out there the other day said to me, he said, I love it. I said, why do you love it? And he said, well, I come home. He works in Boston. He says, I come home. I get off the train. I walk to uh, 30 Haven. I go into Planet Fitness, right, where, excuse me, SNAP. Snap Fitness, I do a workout, I feel really great, I feel righteous, so righteous. And then I walk down the street, just two stores down, and I go into Portland Pie where I have pizza and a beer. And then I think about date night coming, and I walk back down to Pamplemousse, and I pick up a great bottle of wine. He says, this is a great place to live. I said, do you use your car? He said, well, four. Right. So we're doing good. Um, housing. Um, we've got 53 units uh, under the 40R Smart Growth uh, Overlay District guidelines. 20% uh, of those are affordable. I also would like to mention that 29% of them are affordable to the people that someone was talking about earlier today that uh, make up to 120% of the AMI, known as workforce housing. It's not mandated, though. It's not regulated. It, just is what's needed in that town at this time. The garage, the garage, the garage. The garage has what, 70, uh, 78 spaces, 53 spaces for 53 units, um, 12 spaces uh, for a second stall that people have to rent, 
And um, then the other thing we did was for the employees upstairs, the retail people, we uh, added uh, 12 spaces. I want to say one thing is uh, we have older people in our building and they like the underground parking for a couple of reasons. One is snow, just weather, and the second is safety and security. I thought you'd be interested a, a, a little bit about our residents because of all the discussion we've had about who needs cars and who doesn't. 40% of our residents are Gen Y um, and 16% and of our residents are 70 and older. 34% are in between, but what's really interesting is we have nobody in the building who's 60 uh, in that decade which is really interesting. Most of them are still in single family homes and the people that we do have um, who are older have moved out of their single family homes. They're on fixed incomes and this is a reasonable rent for them. I asked people, uh, I did a little snapshot. I said, how, you know, how, how do you get to work? Fascinating. With this breakdown, 39% of the people did not commute. I said, what do you mean you don't commute? Either they're retired and they're not going to work, or their commuting is by foot, 39% in the building. 25% um, take the commuter rail, and then 36% um, commute by car. So when you go downstairs uh, during the day, the, the, the garage is still about, uh, often about half, half full with people, uh, because people just aren't using their cars. And some of the older people keep a parking space um, so that their children can come and visit them and have some place to park when they come. It's kind of interesting. So back to uh, parking. I think that if anything, I've come to the end of the day with a uh, fuller understanding of both the complexity of the parking challenge and the breadth of corresponding solutions. However, practical soul that I am, I really have to look at if you don't have a car, then you don't have to park it. That said, I do understand that the road or the transit from believing that you have to have a car to understanding that you don't necessarily have to have a car is a long and winding road, which I will not sing. Um, Oak tree, two things I want to say. Ah, I only have a minute. Two things I want to say. The first thing we need is education. The second thing we need is, is infrastructure. Um, I listened a lot, a lot of good information today, a lot of things happening, but how do we start to talk to people? Because frankly, it's not the people sitting in this room that, uh, that we have to talk to, it's the larger public. So how do we do it? And I really believe that one way we really can do it is to first of all answer these questions. Why do people need cars? And more importantly, why do they think they need cars? What information will help people to change their minds and change their habits? We have to change our habits. And finally, how do we disseminate this information and evaluate the impact? If we could answer those three questions, I think we'd be a lot further along than we are today. And as a small organization, it's hard for us to contribute much because we don't have time. But please, count us in because we'd very much like to be an active member of that conversation and answering those questions. Thank you. All right, Krista, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I also, uh, as we're getting ready to hear from Sarah, I just want to recognize uh, Jonathan Greeley is here from the Boston Redevelopment Authority. It's good to see uh, our um, city officials here. And also Vineet Gupta, who was also on the um, uh, Greater Boston last night. He was, he was interviewed and extensively about this very issue. So from the Boston Transportation Department. And there are likely other officials in the room. And if you're here, let us know. Um, I uh, would like to now turn it over to Sarah Hamilton from MASCO. Um, Sarah? Thanks, Mike. It's great to see you again in a new role. Um, we miss you at City Council, but I know you're going to do great things as a journalist. Is that, what, is that where you go? I'm a professional moderator. Professional actually. moderator. I, uh, great. No, yeah, I'm a lawyer at Prince Lobel <laughs> Law Firm, and I'm writing for the Boston Globe. I do a weekly piece for the opinion section, 
uh, and maybe try to find a way to, to put something uh, from, from here in. So, uh, right. Sarah. So um, I, I think I'm here because we're an example of practitioners of demand management. Um, we both manage a parking supply as well as manage demand reductions in the area of the city called Longwood. We also call it the LMA, so that's what Longwood Medical and Academic Area, LMA. Um, chances are, if you've been in this state for any amount of time, you've probably been to the LMA or been through the LMA. You might have gone to school there as a Boston English High School schooler before the school moved or a Boston Latin School uh, graduate. You might have gone to college there. We've got a number of colleges. You may have had a baby there. You may have been born there. You may have... <laughs> um, you may have visited a sick relative, um, or you may have tried to get through there during a Red Sox game. Um, just to show of hands quickly, have, how, how many people have been either in or through the Longwood area? Was it easy? No. no. You walked, all right, okay. <laughs> and Vineet Gupta says it's easy, so I guess we're doing our job, right, Vineet? <laughs> um, so we are... <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't start the slideshow. Great, thank you. So we are an institutional area, largely, uh, with 24 institutions, including some of the largest teach teaching hospitals in Boston, such as Brigham and Women's, B.I. Deaconess Medical Center, Children's Hospital. We also have uh, members, including the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the Joslin Diabetes Center. I mentioned our colleges. We have six of them. They're actually in a consortium of their own, and each of them has probably pretty good brand recognition. Uh, in this room, Simmons, Emanuel, Wentworth, Mass Art, Mass Pharmacy, um, and Awila College are a couple of our colleges. We have museums, we have temples, uh, and we have the Merck Scientific Research Center, uh, their headquarters in Boston. So we're a very, very busy area. And MASCO itself is a small nonprofit uh, which provides direct services to these institutions. Um, and we were actually formed about 40 years ago to pr promote a sense of community and also to help resolve some issues. Back in the day, they thought they had parking issues. They did. They do. Um, they had transportation issues. They did. They do. <laughs> uh, and they had planning and development issues uh, still abounding. Um, and they had a need for shared services. Uh, so we do each and every one of those um, particular services. What, so. Let me start by saying that while we are actively trying to and succeeding in reducing, um, in changing people's driving patterns, parking really, really, really matters to the Longwood community. Um, you might have guessed why, because we are a huge patient care area. Um, our hospitals and clinics see the sickest of patients from all over the state and even internationally and nationally. And we see this trend continuing in the future as um, more and more networks form and as the sickest folks cannot get the, the kind of care that they need um, outside of the Longwood community and other major teaching hospitals. Today we have about 55% of all Boston-based inpatient and outpatient visits, and that's a lot of people. It's about 2.4 million patients annually coming in to our small 215-acre district. And the vast majority of patients really don't take the tea. They can't take the tea. Um, they're not going to be discharged by the big nurse after a medical procedure. If you've had a procedure recently, you know that you've got to have a ride home and they won't let you out uh, without one. Uh, it's either a cab or a, a person, a family member who's, who um, has volunteered to drive you home. They might be immunocompromised, they may be in walkers, they might be in wheelchairs, they might be on crutches. Um, a lot of patients actually come in by transfer ambulances. We're seeing a lot of folks come in and out from nursing homes and rehab centers. So we have a really auto-dependent patient population, and there are millions of them. So why manage demand for parking? Well, because <laughs> um, in addition to all of the patients, we have uh, thousands of employees, about 47,000 employees, about 21,000 um, students. Uh, vendors, volunteers, and contractors all are coming to the Longwood area daily. And in fact, we figured out one time that it was like having a Red Sox home game three times a day uh, in terms of the number of people trying to come into our area. And if you've been to a, a ball game, you know how congested that really can be. So we try to manage the parking supply for patients and visitors as well as for key medical staff. We try to manage the, the parking demand 
by employees. And um, let me get to a, some, some of the ways that we do that. As we continue to grow, um, and we have been growing rapidly over the years, we have about 18 million square feet of development with 47,000 employees. And as we grow, this means really less parking per capita or per, per job that we create. Um, we've created about 1,000 jobs per year for the last decade or more. Uh, but you can see by this diagram that the relative supply of parking is, is pretty low. Um, the city has assisted this greatly by adopting, I don't know how many years ago, 15 years ago? Um, I'm looking at Vineet. Um, different parking ratios for all of the districts in Boston. In our district, they are managing a 0.75 space per thousand square feet of new development. So you can imagine that's helped, really helped to sort of squeeze out any excess in the parking supply that's available to the institutions. And where do our employees come from? Well, we, we have folks traveling from all over uh, New England and Massachusetts. In fact, 4% uh, come from the seven New England states, we think daily. Um, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Maine, and Vermont. One third of our employees actually come from the city of Boston, which we think is significant. We're really delighted because that means they're potential walkers um, or maybe even cyclists. Another 20% of our population come from very near, nearby communities, Boston, Cambridge, I'm sorry, not Boston, but um, Cambridge, Somerville, Newton, and Brookline. And then fully 40% come from every place else in the Commonwealth. We, we literally have voters from every single political jurisdiction in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. What that means is our employees' commutes are very, very long. Uh, we did a survey with Massing Polling Group about a year and a half ago. And whether people are driving in from the north or they are taking commuter rail from the South Shore, whether they're on a city bus from Dorchester, Mattapan, or West Roxbury, um, these are all long commutes. And we figured out that about 62% of our employees have a commute that's more than 40 minutes, which is well above the statewide average of 28 minutes. Now, congestion on the T is, a, is the bane of our existence, but congestion on the roads over which uh, people not only drive, but also the T buses roll, is also the bane of every commuter. And then, on the other hand, reliability and availability of public transportation is really the bane of mode shifting. Um, if you're going to try to get people out of their cars, you really have to have a terrific, and we do, um, public transportation system, um, which is reliable and will get people to where they need to go on time. So what do we do um, to, to assist? Well, a couple of things. First, uh, we offer a uh, commute work service, which actually one of my former employees helped me start that years ago, Rob Tassinari, who's doing demand management out in the suburbs now. But we started commute works, oh, it had to be 20 years ago, um, to provide different kinds of incentive programs to employees to get them out of their cars. We also provide um, direct services, both parking on site and parking off site, as well as shuttle services. Um, shuttles come from our off site parking lots, but we also have uh, three or four fixed route shuttles that come in from um, nearby stations, and I'll get to that in a second. We also do planning and engineering studies on improvements for every single mode, and these are all privately funded. We will also actually construct improvements that we think are um, valid and might improve any of the modes for getting into the Longwood. And we do a lot of advocacy with the Public Transportation Agency. Let me give you some specifics. So commute works, uh, the incentive programs um, among them are uh, for biking and walking. Our commute fit program, for example, has about 3,000, maybe 3,200 registrants. And what this is is a voluntary program where people actually log in their biking and walking miles. And every month, their names are entered into a drawing for some cool prizes, maybe a $50 gift certificate for REI or, or some other um, venue that maybe you can buy some good running shoes at. Um, biking and walking are huge for our area, so um, this is a big part of what we do. We also pay for change. Uh, a program that we call Commute Swap will actually pay an employee to put their parking space on hold for three months. In the interim, we will provide, at no cost to the employee, the T-Pass subsidy, and we'll let folks try transit for three months. If at the end of that pilot period they decide that it's not for them, uh, we give the parking space, or the institution will give them their parking space back, no questions asked. Um, and will um, and the person can return to driving. But we have found that people um, do stick with transit after they've tried it. We also have a very active carpool pro program um, with people getting uh, three months of gas cards for $50 a piece. 
And if they're still together as a carpool after nine months, we'll give them an extra bonus of $100 just to celebrate their, um, their uh, uh, continued driving um, shared ride. Members also financially support public transportation, and um, that means $10 million of uh, TPAS subsidies per year for over 200,000 T-passes, and um, that has an annual revenue stream for the T of about $19 million. Our private shuttles supplement MBTA services. We have a rolling stock of about 35 buses, soon to be new in, in July, and we subsidize w about $8 million worth of operations annually to get people to and from those parking lots, as well as these fixed routes. Um, the woman to my left, Krissa, has a, a train station 800 yards away. We, our train stations are a half a mile to a mile away, and uh, we're trying to get people to, to Longwood from that last, last to, to the last part of their commute. We carry over 3 million tri passenger trips per year, and we estimate that we are keeping 12,000 vehicles out of the Longwood area daily. We, pay, uh, we plan for new infrastructure. Um, an example here is uh, an engineering study that we did on Ruggles Station, which is an orange line and commuter rail station. Um, took the uh, results of that study to the MBTA. They thought, hmm, that's a pretty good idea. It looks pretty cost effective. Did their own study. Um, it's now in 75% design, and we're all working together to file for federal transportation money um, to try to implement the project. On cycling, we have so many fitness freaks in the medical institutions. Um, you can imagine we have more demand for bicycling and bicycle facilities than we know how to keep up with. Um, a year ago, we were partnered with Charlotte uh, at, at the city of Boston. Uh, the city did the design for a brand new bike lane, and we actually did the implementation using private funding, about $45,000 of thermoplastic and a bike box uh, to improve safety. On a bike week, Typical bike week, we have 19,000 miles logged in for only 600 bicyclists, and they're not lying. It's really true. They're out there. Uh, we're also working very hard to improve the pedestrian environment. Uh, with so many people who can walk, we think it's great to, to try to make a pleasant walk. And um, I'm going to go back one second. Um, this is a, a shot of Huntington Avenue where the state actually implemented the improvements in the transit median and on the sidewalks. and we as a private entity have been maintaining those trees and um, sidewalks for at least five years now. We will plant anything in sight. You can see any little spare piece of land that's next to a sidewalk. We'll put fragrant bushes in. Uh, we've got planters in the medians and we'll even hang baskets off of the, uh, the streetlight poles uh, when we can find them. Um, we're always working on someone else's property but with their permission and with our funding. And we'll also help you find your way um, we have done a variety of signage programs, including vehicular signage programs, as well as uh, within the last two years, we implemented a brand new pedestrian program. We advocate for tea services, really, really important. Um, some of you may have seen recently that Yaki Station opened near um, Fenway Park, and um, after long years of work by many, including an initial planning study by Masco, um, the train station is now open, and what when we had uh, before 19 Bus, uh, train stopping there, we've actually gotten up to 48 trains stopping, and it's a huge improvement for the Longwood commuters. Masco picks up people and brings them back from the train station. That was part of the deal years ago when the T said, the only way we'll expand this from game day service for you is if you agree to pick up the people. So we did. Um, we also work in um, circulation, signage, enforcement, um, signal improvements, and a wide, wide array of things. Um, this is an example of a Don't Block the Box campaign, again, with Boston's engineers saying, OK, we'll help you do that. We'll approve your plan. Um, we implemented the signage and then called upon the city police to help us do the enforcement. And we found that about 50% better compliance after the implementation of the campaign. So the results, it works. We're really, really, really super excited to see um, our most recent figures where we have significantly shifted employees from driving. Um, in the last 12 to 14 years, we've increased our transit use by 12%. Drive and loan dropped by a whopping 19%. And walk bike increased by 7%. Carpooling and van pooling, I swear they're un-American. Um, we, we like them a lot, but it's, I think it's really hard to share uh, your life with so many people. Um, so our, our share of um, carpool and van pooling has maintained its you know, been pretty consistent about four or five percent over the years. I'd just like to sort of conclude with the future of parking demand in the Longwood area. Um, what we see is more additional housing options nearby, which enhance the walk to work opportunities. 
Um, we'd like to see more cyclists and would be actively planning for facilities and accommodations for them. We definitely need more parking supply. The patients don't drive, and I don't see that changing terrifically in the future. Um, so well-managed and tightly managed par parking supply options, both on and off-site, are critical to the institutions. But most importantly, I think, more public transportation is key. Um, if you've got people um, in a reliable and frequent ride, they're going to change their mode and their minds. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, presentation is, um, or words of, uh, of wisdom are from Peter Spellios from uh, Related. Uh, so I, I decided to forego the PowerPoint presentation and give you a, a really quick uh, backdrop of the, of the Lovejoy Wharf and then uh, be quiet because I'm thinking the questions are going to steer the dialogue much more than, than anything I'm going to say uh, this afternoon. Um, so Lovejoy Wharf, and, and as much as I would, would like to think it's because I'm a parking expert is why I'm here today, it's, I have a feeling, again, it's about Lovejoy Wharf a little bit. So let me just give you a little background on Lovejoy Wharf. Um, our history with Lovejoy Wharf started in December of 2012. Um, Lovejoy Wharf itself has a history that goes back many centuries before us, but the most relevant history goes back to 2006 when um, the prior owner of the site commenced a, a redevelopment strategy for um, the wharf. Um, that strategy resulted in a all residential proposed apartment uh, development that proposed a 300 plus car robotic garage. Um, next year we'll talk about robotic garages. Um, today we'll skip that topic. Um, that project got engulfed in um, very heavy public debate, uh, some of which happened in public, in public arenas in front of the BRA. A lot of it happened in the courts uh, and sidelined that project uh, until um, 2013. Fast forward to 2012, uh, Related Beale uh, acquired the project. Um, as you may know, the cornerstone of uh, our redevelopment strategy was converting one half of the project, which was going to be residential, into the world headquarters for Converse. Converse is currently located north of Boston, had been looking at this very project for various reasons, hadn't yet decided this is what they wanted to do, um, and, and we embarked on a, a pretty... Um, um, accelerated dating period with Converse that concluded with them agreeing that this was the perfect place for them to have their world headquarters. Um, with the, the help of the community and, and the BRA, um, we very quickly um, revisited the permitting that had happened in 2006. Uh, the litigation had uh, ended in a settlement um, by that time. Um, and the conversation really quickly uh, and solely focused on the Converse building, the Converse building being what's known as the Hoffman Building, which is the one closest to North Washington Street. It's the one that's currently being rehabbed, and uh, for those that didn't know what building it is, we put a big sign on the top that says Converse um, to help everybody. Um, at that time in December of 2012, that was the conversation, right? And, and we all remember what was going on in 2012. We were just beginning to see a little bit of daylight in the economy, and having Converse decide that they were going to come to Boston um, was obviously a big deal and was a, a symbolic um, gesture as well um, to, to what was to come in the next uh, 18 months after that. Um, during that process, uh, we freely acknowledged that we didn't know what we were going to do with the remaining pro part of the project, and that was going to be the new development site. There's another whole building that was contemplated. And at that point in time, all we knew is that we were taking 50% of the residential units and making it office, and because of the speed at which we were operating, frankly, we didn't know what we were going to do with the remaining of the project. Um, the buildings were contemplated to be one interconnected, unified residential development, and we were lopping off 50%. But the commitment that we made in 2012 was that we weren't going to seek to undo all the dimensional discussion that had plagued this project for years. And there's a lot of different dimensional things you can talk about, but I, I'm guessing you can all realize probably there was only real one dimension that most people cared about at the time, and it was height. Um, but in 2012, we made the um, commitment that we weren't going to revisit the height factor, the height that had been pre previously approved in 2006. That was the subject of litigation and that had all been settled, it was the height in which we were going to, to live within. Um, fast forward nine months later, 
um, we again revisited with the community and with the city, and we came back with our new idea as to what we wanted to do for the new development portion of, of uh, the residential, the remaining residential. Um, we decided to keep it as residential. Um, instead of apartments, we decided that we were going to do condominiums. Um, but the real news, I guess, that came out at the time was, besides being one of the first projects large scale to say that we're going to do condominiums, after being in a doldrums of condominium development for quite some time, um, we made the decision that the robotic garage uh, would be eliminated from the project um, and that we would not be replacing it with any type of garage uh, in the project. Um, so let me jump to the end and then we can backfill with questions, any details that I'm leaving out. Um, it really, it's complicated and I think as evidenced by the fact you can spend more than one day talking about this, it's a really complicated decision. Um, and my takeaway from this whole process isn't about um, the foresight of a developer or, or the wisdom of a development team in what we're doing here. Um, my takeaway has to do with the fact that this was a, a moment in time and a specific project in a specific neighborhood with a specific set of facts that allowed for this decision to be made. Uh, but the one clear takeaway for me is, and I'm sitting in a room with, with people who represent various municipalities here, is that we are within a municipality that was more than thoughtful about their approach here. Um, and from my perspective, I'm representing the development side here, that's the gold standard, right? There's nothing more I can expect reasonably than thoughtfulness. And different communities handle things in different ways. I live in a community where, I will tell you candidly, we have no parking and it starves our downtown. It starves our retail and as a result, our retail turns over you know, more often than our calendars do uh, in our town. In the city of Boston, you know, we found um, willing participants to the dialogue, not, not with a predisposed end to the dialogue, but to a thoughtful discussion and one that lasted many months, uh, in addition to the ones that we had with neighbors, direct neighbors, community groups, advocacy groups uh, about this dialogue here. Um, so I'm going to not necessarily go into all the details now. I'm happy to go into the, the questions about it here. Um, but, but clearly, our decision uh, was part physical which is we made a commitment not to expand the size of a project. It was part healthy cynicism about a robotic garage. Um, it was part understanding the expense factor in building within a tidal basin and realizing that all your parking needed to be above grade and the economic feasibility or not of, of being able to do that. And it also is a recognition of, and I think the city's recognition of, this is a one of a kind neighborhood. And this is maybe a one-of-a-kind site where you can make this type of decision relative to parking, and that's because of the proximity to public transit. Uh, there is a wealth of infrastructure sitting here. Um, if you didn't know it, the, the, the decision by Converse to come to this site is not accidental. I already pointed out that they're coming from the north of the city. One of their primary considerations had to do with where their existing employee base is and making sure that there would be ease of access for them to get this new facility. Um, there is obviously the orange line, the green line, uh, an abundance of bus lines serving the premises. Um, so really it is one of those locations. In addition, uh, we are about to create a whole other mode of public transportation. As part of the Lovejoy project, we're committing about $25 million of infrastructure. That includes building an acre wharf that doesn't exist, that has never been public um, there, but it also is about providing very large subsidies for both scheduled and non-scheduled ferry service. Um, those plans are, are in the works with, with the city of Boston and, and determining how exactly that's going to be outlined. Um, but to tell you the demand is there would be an understatement. I've heard every other project in the city of Boston, I might have even heard a casino or two talk about how they're going to have ferry service to Lovejoy Wharf. Of course, I've only read about them in the paper. I've never actually received a phone call about any of these things. Um, but it, it just goes to show you, right, is that the this is a new world here uh, that we're, we're dealing with here, and I think there's a recognition about the constraints of what you know, our streets are going to support, and, and the demand on public transportation is going to be greater than ever. So let me stop there, and um, we can get to questions. Yeah, that's excellent. All right. Great job, Peter. All of you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to do questions. I, I'd actually, let me start it off uh, and start with Sarah, actually, if I could. Um, Sarah, the doctors, the surgeons, uh, they expect to drive right up to the OR, do they not? Or are they also changing? Are you seeing the kind of upper echelon of seasoned, uh, tenured doctors, um, surgeons? Are you seeing them also 
uh, affected by uh, the rest of us. I think it's a mixture. I mean, you know, obviously you don't want your surgeon to, to arrive uh, late. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a fair amount of a need to access the parking supply. A lot of our physicians will also do research as well as teaching, and um, I think it's, it's likely that people flex their modes depending on their schedules. Okay. We have a huge bike, biking population from the researchers. Yeah, I would imagine a, quite a few of them are on bikes. Mm -hmm. All right, questions? Yes, back over there. And then I saw a hand over there. Is that yes? I did. Thank you. My my question's for Peter. Uh, uh, it's a two-part question. The first is, uh, what led you? And I mean this in a completely supportive way. Um, what you guys decided to do with no parking at Love Troy Wharf for the condos is um, something a lot of us uh, in the region think about and support. But my uh, two questions. First. Um, what led you to conclude that people buying a $900,000 condo don't need a place to put a car? Uh, and the second question um, is, did you have trouble raising any, any financing from, um, from lenders who questioned the wisdom of that decision? Um, I earlier mentioned that I wasn't going to do a PowerPoint, but I was going to do a dance. This is where the dance begins. Um, those are good questions. Um, second one first. Um, you know, on, on the residential side, we um, have a really strong brand and track record. Um, and um, we are not a volume shop. You will never in any given year hear about us doing 10 projects in downtown Boston or somewhere else. Uh, we're pretty selective about where we're doing our projects. Um, the ones that I think are the highest profiles are the, are the, the Clarendons or, or, or luxury or ultra luxury products. Uh, we happen to also have 50,000 affordable units in one of the largest affordable portfolios uh, in the country. It's a little known fact, but it's something that we take a lot of great pride in. And we are related actually started uh, by Steve Ross as an affordable housing uh, firm. Um, so, so that hasn't been um, the dialogue. As, as a matter of fact, quite differently. Um, I think the waterfront in Boston, to the extent, in my opinion, to the extent there was any concerns about any aspect of the project, the waterfront does a lot, of, lot to heal the soul. And uh, even lenders are a lot more friendly when they're staring at the ocean um, about things here. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the buying public's um, receptivity to, to buying units here, um, you know, we have a lot of experience in a lot of other projects. A couple of takeaways. Um, we were pleasantly surprised that the um, number of parking spaces that were allocated to condominium units at the Clarendon down the street here were not nearly as aggressive as you would think they would be. Um, not nearly as strong a public infrastructure here. Obviously, we have the orange line in the Back Bay Commuter Rail Station located near the Clarendon, which is on the corner of Stewart and Clarendon, um, but not nearly the amount of infrastructure there. Um, but yet, in that project, um, which is a 500,000 square foot project with 100 condominiums and 178 residential units, we have 300 and let's just say 75 parking spaces. Um, so a very healthy ratio there, but yet when we sold the condominiums, um, the, the demand, for those condom demand for parking spaces with those condominiums wasn't nearly uh, what one would have expected it to be. Um, so I think that's a data point that's relevant to us. I, I think the other thing has to do with, we did a very honest assessment of what was happening in the neighborhood here. Um, we were all in the development business, whether you're on the development side or on the other side, it doesn't, or in the public arena, we're all in the development business and we understand um, the rhetoric that's sometimes used about showing numbers of parking spaces that are there, disregarding the fact that, you know, 80% of them are proposed to be redeveloped into something else or, or something of that nature. Um, we did a pretty honest assessment of what was going on in that neighborhood and the availability of, of other parking solutions, and that didn't include on-street parking. I know there's been conversation about resident parking passes. Um, this is a neighborhood that if you actually looked at a plan of the West End slash North End slash Charlestown neighborhood, um, you would see very limited on-street resident parking relative to other neighborhoods where you see a lot of it, right? A lot of this parking spaces uh, on that street. So we actually didn't take any of that into consideration. Um, but we looked at other parking opportunities within a, within a limited radius and to be able to say, how can they be serviced there? Um, I think that what's happened, and again, knowing our buyer pool pretty well, we're, we're pretty confident that those that are going to need a car are going to find um, locations, and we're going to facilitate helping them find off-street parking locations for their cars. But I think more and more, especially in downtown Boston, um, it is 
um, not verboten anymore for the person that's living in the Clarendon to walk down the street and go to the Orange Line and get on the Orange Line or get into a zip car or get onto one of the bike share programs and, and doing that. That's really um, more and more mainstay in Boston. Um, so we're, we're pretty bullish about that. And Las Carvas School of Public Health. So thank you for all the LMA details. Car parking. No one would drive a car if they didn't have a place to park their car at home. No one would drive a car if they didn't have a place to park their car at their destination. If it was a pain in the neck to park the car at the destination, they would get there, drive around, and then go back home. So they would not stay at the destination. When we talk about replacing car trips, we forget that if we replace the car trips with the bicycle, it is just as important to provide bike parking at home and to provide bike parking at our destination. I'm an academic researcher. My PhD's in architecture. I've done nothing but bikes for the past 32 years. For infectious diseases, we changed buildings. We put in elevator shafts for better ventilation. We put in bathrooms inside. We put in sinks. Now, even in hospital rooms, we put in sinks to wash our hands all the times. We have far more diseases from chronic diseases. Since the bicycle was invented in 1895, we've never really brought the bicycle inside. We say it's OK to have it outside in a bad bike rack. You get a lead point for parking a bike in a bad wheel bender bike rack out in the front lawn. Would the three of you consider putting bike parking inside the offices, homes, shops, and schools, inside an office complex? You have a freight elevator. You're able to take your bike up on the elevator. It fits the bike inside easily. You can wheel your bike with your panniers, what are your briefcases? into the cubicle and you park your bike beside your cubicle. In the apartment buildings, you're able to take your bike inside your apartment, not in a basement cage. If you've got a child, you don't want to take the child off the bike with the groceries and then have to get into an elevator and go up. You're able to wheel the bike inside. Don't hang it on the wall as that little 30 square foot apartment module because a female cannot lift a heavy Dutch bike with baskets and panniers and the skirt guard. In the grocery stores, change the grocery store layout so you can wheel the bicycle in the grocery store. And in the schools, we need far more indoor bike parking on the Longwood Medical Campus because we're having everybody, except for a few people who can park in a bike cage outside where the snow comes in sideways and the canvas roofs caves in from the snow, we're making people park their bikes in a far less desirable place compared to parking underground if they can pay for the car parking. So how can you put in your bike, in your apartment modules, parking for bikes? And how can you also put a module in the apartment complex that is a street level public bar parking space? Uh, we have bicycle parking in all of our buildings, inside, downstairs in the garage no on racks you just pull it up park it there it's secure you don't have to lock it unless you're worried that another tenant's going to take it we don't have anything upstairs uh, although some people do take their bikes up let me tell you a story um, i have uh in my reading building i've got uh two two tenants uh, a young couple they, uh, they were both doing city year last year, so they're um, uh, looking at all different ways to, to kind of be able to live on a very minimum income, right? And what happens is they decided on Reading because she gets on the, the uh, transit and goes into work every day, and he is getting his master's at a school, and what he does is he every day takes his bicycle, he gets onto the commuter <coughs> rail, he take, goes out, gets off at the stop, and bicycles into, um, into, uh, into his job and into school. And one of the important things was to make sure that he had some place to keep his bicycle because it really is an important part of uh, making sure that, that he has a, a good standard of living and a good quality of life. 
Sure. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that Masco also does is we own and run an, a, an office building. And um, it's common to see people wheel their bicycles into the elevators and up to their offices or shared spaces. So, um, you know, in our own complex, whatever the, the tenant wants to do about bicycles, they are able to do. I think, you know, in terms of indoor parking elsewhere, space is at such a premium everywhere in the Longwood community, whether it's inside or outside in garages, um, research labs, it's, it's such a premium. I'm not sure is my answer to your question. And, and if you've got some good models, I'd love to see them uh, because we, we like to engage new ideas. Mm -hmm. So please stop by and we'll talk. Uh, that's a, a great question. Um, look, at, I, I think the industry is really turning its attention back to bicycles. And, um, you know, John Greeley's here, and I'll tell you, John and I have met, the last three times we've met, we've been talking about bicycles. And um, it's not accidental, right? The city and the state have obviously in, uh, has expended considerable money really making it more amenable on the streets and in appropriate places for bicycles. And we spend as much time now talking about pedestrian bike conflict as we do about vehicular pedestrian conflict in our design discussions. And, and John and I are having this um, healthy dialogue currently. Um, uh, about pedestrian bike conflict, which is somewhat remarkable that I don't think five or ten years ago that would have been the dialogue that we would have been having in these conversations. Uh, that being said, I think some communities are doing some really neat things. Obviously, BTD and the city of Boston have some um, bike expectations. Um, Cambridge has some, um, I don't want to use the word aggressive because I don't want it to be deemed to be a negative, but have some um, um, big ideas as to, to bike storage. Um, I was recently, I think it's either Vox on 2 or the Atwater, I think it's Vox on 2, which is built where old faces used to be on Route 2 in, in West Cambridge. And not only do they have a bike, bike storage room that, you know, frankly is bigger than most of the units they're renting in the place, um, but they also have upgraded bike storage if you want to pay a little bit more, where you, it's almost like you hang out with your bike. Um, and so just to give you a sense of how it's now in the brain set of the developer, right? And I think that's just going to keep coming um, in, in more and more. So, so I don't have all the answers, but I think so you should sit there with optimism that not only is the, the public realm focusing on it, but, you know, the development community is, is very focused on it as well. Yeah, good one, Ann. Uh, question here. And Ann, you should tweet out, you know, examples that you think are, uh, are good so the rest of us can, uh, can read about it. Send, send it out to us, please. Yes. Hi, my name is Matthew Danish. Um, I think my question is for Chris mostly. Um, so you talked about this project you did on Massachusetts Avenue, mm -hmm. I believe. Is that in Cambridge? Yeah. All right. So you said that you had the situation where you were going to unbundle, charge a separate rent for the parking lot, and that the neighbors complained, and they forced you to bundle it with the rent. So I see that play out in a bunch of other mm -hmm. projects around the area. And I'm really concerned because what happens to the people who don't have cars? They're now being forced to pay for parking that they're not going to use. Uh, that makes it, the housing less affordable. And this all happened because neighbors bullied your project into not using the public space that the neighbors don't own. And this happens in Cambridge which I think highlights some of the hypocrisy of Cambridge, which Donald Shoup kind of needled you guys on. I don't know if anyone's here. But uh, I've seen that in other aspects of Cambridge policy. I don't think Cambridge should have allowed that to happen because this is really an affordability issue. And people who, who don't want to pay for parking because they don't have a car should be allowed to do that. What do you think about that? You know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, throughout the day, on, on a, Almost everybody has talked about the importance of the conversations and having the conversations and getting all the stakeholders together and trying to work something out, right? That was the best idea at that time in order to make sure that the community as a whole, which included the residents in the building, were able to walk down the street and get along with each other. I don't, I don't have any solutions. But that's what we did at that time. We don't build enough buildings that we've got a whole lot of different experiences. Good point, though. Uh, another question. We have time for a couple more. 
there's there's a couple on the other side of the room. We should we shouldn't neglect them, and then maybe uh, we can come back over here. So I think I saw there's five minutes. I think I saw three hands. One of them's a neighbor, uh, and then we should be able to do this. Okay, please. Uh, so actually, this ended up being more related to the last question than I thought it would be. Um, uh, this this one's actually for uh, for Peter. Um, and any developer really in the city of Boston or, 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 the, or the neighborhood. Um, ha have you guys really put together solid numbers on exactly how much parking requirements you are made to live with affect the actual costs of your units? And in the case of the particular development uh, on the pier you're talking about, uh, how much you were able to save your residents by not having to build those parking um, lots? And kind of on a related note, um, I'm wondering why more developers don't make use of the uh, lobbying against having to build all these parking spaces as a way to sort of uh, advocate that they're building more affordable housing by doing so, market rate affordable housing, if you will, if that makes sense. Um, does any other developer in Boston or the neighborhoods want to answer that? <laughs> he, he did offer it to more than just me. Um, uh, you know, it's a good question. Look, it, d development typically is is organic in the sense that we sit with a piece of paper and we say, what is it we're going to build? So it's more iterative, right? It's about saying, how much density can I get? How much parking supply do I need? How much more density can I get to offset the parking supply that I need? Oh, I need more parking. And so it's a, it's a rather iterative, iterative process here, right? So there isn't this black book that we open up and say, this is what we're going to do on this site. This is what the parking is. Let's go. Um, Lovejoy, as I described it to you purposely, was not iterative in the sense that I knew what my maximum envelope was because I stood up in front of a neighborhood in December of 2012 and said, this is our maximum envelope. And um, we firmly believe in standing by things like that when we make that kind of commitment. So it was a little less iter iterative for us because I now knew my denominator, right? I, I knew what my greatest denominator would be. and. For us, getting into a little bit more of the math, I still, just because you take away 50% of your units doesn't mean that you take away 50% of the cost to operate your units. So I ended up with 50% of, of a residential project with probably still close to 90% of the cost to operate a residential project. The math very quickly stops making sense for the project here. So we had to look for ways to kind of recalibrate you know, how we could afford to operate a project um, with a limited supply of units and um, made the decision that you know we need to expand, you know, within the envelope to to have more residential space uh, within an envelope, and, and made the calculated decision in that scenario that it obviously was going to be ex the expense of parking. Um, certainly, we went through the analysis of what if we got rid of the robotic garage and put a more traditional parking garage in there, and it became tremendously inefficient, as I'm sure you know anyone who's played with Legos. Um, understands, right? The second you start building columns and you start doing speed ramps or other things, you, you just, it just becomes ridiculously expensive. Um, so, so there really isn't a, a, a rule of thumb with that. Um, I think the reason the development community hasn't gotten out there and, and, and advocated for lack of parking is because, you know, I don't think this is something that is going to be driven by the development side. I don't think this is a dialogue that's going to be driven by the, the, the public domain in terms of the public stakeholders. I don't think it's as simple as the public stakeholders saying, we're going to do no parking. We're going to do less parking. We're going to force it upon the, the development world. I mean, I think Lovejoy in a lot of ways, again, I want to really be very careful to say, I don't think the decision at Lovejoy is a traditional decision. I don't think it was one that was about the foresight of the development team. I think it was one that was a confluence of, of many facts in a complicated environment with a thoughtful public stakeholder that was willing to engage in the dialogue. But I think that um, when you find that tipping point between incentives and motivations to the development side and the kind of the public sector, I think that's where you're going to find that balance here. Um, I sit here today perfectly fine and comfortable with our decision to do no parking. Right? There's not a thing about it that bothers me about our decision here. But that's because in this scenario, right, in, in the rules that were established for this development, uh, it made sense for us to make that decision here, um, where I think it balanced a lot of public and private objectives to come to what we think is going to be a, a really dynamic, terrific result for, for everybody here. So I just don't think it's that binary um, to think as though this is going to be a development. You know, I've never sat in a dark back room with a 
smoking cigars with developers where we plot against parking. Um, it hasn't happened yet, right? Um, but what, what we will do is that when it's a really good idea in a case specific situation, whether it's no parking or something else, we'll sit and, we'll sit and have you know, thoughtful dialogues with the public stakeholders. Speed answers, speed questions. Okay, hi, I'm Allison Poultonison from Mission Hill and very familiar with the Longwood parking. Um, Sarah, I just wanted to ask a couple things related to the general um, conversation about uh, transit and walking because um, uh, there was a discussion that people will walk 0.6 miles from a transit station to their des destination. And you mentioned the Yawkey station and thinking that Yawkey Station is less than 0.6 miles to the LMA, um, so questioning the need for shuttles, um, and also thinking, again, what you mentioned about the third platform at Ruggles, bringing more commuters directly uh, into, um, close to their destination. So it, do you foresee a change in the shuttle pattern and encouraging people to actually uh, get off the train and walk? walk to work, and also um, you mentioned the 0.75 uh, parking ratio per 1,000 square feet, and how does that connect with patient parking when so much of the parking in the LMA is still for, for staff? So <clears throat> that's a long question. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try to speed answer. Um, so we do see trying to generate additional walk and bike trips from the commuter rail station. Um, in fact, today, many people actually hop on the hubway from Ruggles and they commute the rest of the way by bicycle. Um, we have a lot of folks who do walk. We have quite a diverse employee population. So we've got young people, middle-aged people, and what we call people going towards their senior years. So there are various uh, capabilities and abilities to walk um, any distance. Um, so shuttle is part of the option that we think we need to provide. Um, actually, we've noticed uh, an increase in our shuttle, in, in demand for our shuttles just recently since the MBTA um, closed the Green Line Station at Government Center. Now about 400 more people per day are trying to get on our buses. So it's kind of crazy. And we're trying to keep people off, actually, because we don't have the supply. And we don't want to expand the service, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I think that's two answers. Three. The third question had to do with what's that? The point seven five. Point seven five. Um, we're estimating that um, e each of the parking spaces that serves the institutions sees about three to four, maybe four turns per day for patients. Um, that's a lot of patient turnover, and I think the fact of the matter is that some employees will have to continue to drive. Um, and some of the key medical staff will have to continue to drive. And I think we, you know, we're a good model of trying our best to, to, to change that trajectory. Um, we have more to do, but I think we're pretty proud of what we have been doing. Okay, uh, last question. Hi, thank you for your presentations. Um, Sarah, quick question for you. Um, if you were given a million dollars to expand your program to get more people to shift modes and engage employees. You listed a lot of great like tactics and strategies, but what is one that you're either doing, you'd put more money into, or one that someone else is doing that you would love to bring to um, Masco? Well, we'd actually like to see better direct transit right into downtown Longwood. Um, many of our services, the public transportation services, are somewhat peripheral. And I think in our future, we see an underground station under Longwood Avenue. We don't know what service will go in there, but we'd love to see a um, million dollars or more put towards an underground uh, MBTA station. Because if you're, if you're traveling on Longwood Avenue, it's pretty congested. Um, all the trucks that are serving the Fenway are coming down Longwood Avenue, not just the trucks that are trying to go to Longwood. Um, and we have many city buses and we have many private shuttle buses and we think the way to go is to get them underground. So that's where we would love to see folks put some money. All right, let me just leave you with this thought. Um, if you look at the newspaper clippings when, I said this last night, uh, Faneuil Hall Marketplace was being constructed in the late 70s or, or was being proposed, the number one complaint that everyone was talking about was 
well, the cars and the parking. And I would just say that it's always been a part of our conversation. Uh, it can't stop us. We have to get smarter and more innovative, and we are. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll conclude this, uh, this panel and let us all thank our panelists, and thank you. Thank you.